Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, we're going to read Psalm 23 on page 563 in the Pew Bible. I will read the odds, you'll read the evens, and we'll read together the last verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pastures, he leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In this psalm, David expresses his great confidence and delight in the constant protection of his loving God. This psalm inspires people as it gives hope, assurance, and guidance. This powerful message reveals the unconditional love that God has for you by being a constant even during dark, dark times. He says, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This shows the devoted love and care that Jesus has toward mankind. Jesus is that good shepherd, which is why most of us connect with this psalm, as we already are aware that Jesus is our good shepherd. This psalm is a song of gratitude to our God in a painful world. Verses 1 and 2 shows how David has complete trust in the protection of his God. We see civilization is losing its civility, and the world is getting ruder, just like David saw. This psalm helps you through those times. In verse 5, you prepare a table before me, you will anoint my head with oil. Here, David recognizes God's goodness to him, even the, through his enemies and tough times. So have faith and trust in God during trying times and during the good times, like David does. In First Peter 419, if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you, for he will never fail you. In this Psalm, verses 6, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is true confidence in God's grace and care. That verse, dwell in the house of the Lord, is mentioned many times through Psalms. This expresses the desire of a true child of God. He wishes to live always and engaging in solemn acts of worship and occupied in holy things. Let's adapt this language and say confidently, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life here, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, which is where God dwells. So we are so blessed. Amen. Yeah, the It has to stay there. <laughs> I hope it'll be loud enough for you, but not too loud. And I pray that there'll be no jets flying overhead today. <laughs> So 
sorry. I didn't bring my words up today because this is a song I know. But I had a brain fart freeze, so please excuse that. <laughs> Should I be discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sky. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing. His tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and fear. I draw thee closer to me, from care he sets me free, his eyes on that sparrow. And I know he watches me, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Amen. Two good words already. The Lord is our shepherd, right? And he, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. And then, of course, his eyes are upon us. We are the sparrow, perfectly. We know that. Um, get some of my notes here. I'd like to start off this morning sharing part of my pastoral letter that was included in our semi-annual meeting this past Friday, June 24th. Time surely has been full and speedy since our last meeting. Take a look at the 2022 review provided in your packet, which those of you that didn't receive one will receive one later today, uh, provided in this packet to see all that was accomplished in and through Blue Point Bible Church over the last six months. I pray that in all of our doing, you have contemplated and have found simplicity, peace, and beauty. We can only exude what we have and nurture within ourselves. We surely have those things. As we often utter, we have all things pertaining to life and godliness. That's 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Yet we must nurture them, or as I often say around this time of year, fan the flame of your spiritual fervor. That's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. As I review all of our doings and ask God for vision, for wisdom, and for inspiration, I cannot help but notice a pattern. 
At Blue Point Bible Church, we truly hold all things in common. For example, common struggles are com conquered through common good. Common sense urges us to common prayer. May we continue in that spirit of the apostles. And I went on to say, our common work, our common life, is God's uncommon solution. So this morning, in order to enter in on what exactly is God's uncommon solution, I want to challenge all three of us with some questions. And if you might, write these on the back of your bulletin for your own self-examination. How are you fanning the flame of your spiritual fervor in this season? Many of you know I call this season the season of fire for a couple reasons. I wear a suit jacket every Sunday and then we're gathering outside. It's warm. It feels like fire. Uh, right now, actually, it's pretty good. But either way, you know, during the summer season, it gets warm outside. So one way to think through spiritual things is, am I on fire for the Lord? Because it's hot out. Is it hotter outside than it is within my heart? Am I containing that spirit, that fire of the Lord in my life? Am I fanning the flames so that the fire might get hotter? Uh, another reason would be it's summertime. That's what we call it. Uh, another reason would be that sometimes during the summer, people tend to be a little bit more lax in their spiritual disciplines than they were in the colder months. And uh, sometimes that's due to more barbecues, more beach fun, more family visiting, whatever it might be. So in the midst of that, not to guilt that, not to say that, you know, you, we, we need family, we need fun at the beach, we need those things. Uh, they're great and God, glor you know, God glorifying in their right respects. However, in the midst of that, make sure you're fanning the flame of your spiritual fervor. Because what we have, we use, we lose if we don't nurture it. If we don't use it, what is, how does the phrase go? If you don't use it, you lose it. Okay, so at least now we all know it. So now it's just a matter of implementing that with our spiritual lives. So again, the first question, what are you doing to fan the flame of your spiritual fervor? The second question, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? What are you listening to? What are you hearing? Those are the three questions that I think are very important to answer what our common work is in this world, what God's uncommon solution is to this world. In other words, there's something we have that's common amongst us as the body of Christ that is uncommon to this world. And that's what we need to get at uh, if we want to understand God's uncommon solution for this world. While many wait for the world to be burned up and they see that as the solution to the society's ills, we endeavor toward, toward carrying and being the fire in this world. A fire that comforts, right? Fire in the right place is a very comforting thing. A fire that benefits, fire in the right place is a beneficial thing. A fire that destroys, again, when things aren't in the right place and fire happens upon them, fire burns them up. We're called to be that fire. Our God is a consuming fire, so we're also called to be that fire, to replicate his presence for the things that God wants to bring comfort to, the blessings and the benefit God wants to provide, the things that God wants to destroy. And yes, there are things in our midst that God wants to destroy. And then purify. There's things in our midst that God wants to purify, wants to restore to their former glory. Our job is to be that fire and to restore those things to his former glory. Now, again, for the world, that looks like it's impossible. You mean that, uh, what are we, about 14 people this morning on the one? Those 14 people are going to change the world? Those, you know, the Christians aren't exactly a big majority. Uh, and even in the midst of our being a big majority, not a big majority of the Christians are fanning the flame of their spiritual fervor. So, yes, I can imagine to the world they say, this is God's solution. This is what God came up with. And of course, we all know what our Lord said. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So yes, amen. This is God's solution. Because yes, with us, depending on our own strength, while some of you are rather strong spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, depending on our strength, we will fail. It's impossible. But with him, all things are possible. Our Lord is a consuming fire. And therefore, we who know, feel, and share his presence are called to replicate that fire as well. I ask each of you individually this morning, you're going to hear it again and again, how are you fanning the flame of your spiritual fervor? 
We conclude our worship services lately asking the Lord to set a fire down in our soul. Oh, he will. However, again I ask, what are you doing to accompany his work? He'll set the fire. But as we know, we've been doing bonfires. If you look around on our lawn, we got the holes to prove it. Um, in the midst of doing bonfires, what we've noticed is there's times where it looks as though the fire might be out. Sometimes the fire is not out. Sometimes it just needs to be stirred. Somebody needs to blow on it a little bit, fan that flame, and all of a sudden, whew, your clothes goes back up. That's our spiritual life. That's why I love, by the way, that's another reason why I call it the season of fire, is we use the imagery of fire throughout this season, the bonfires and all, to talk about spiritual life, to talk about our faith. And again, many of you know I've come up with quite a few different analogies using the fire. You have fanning the flame, you have, uh, you know, when the fire seems like it goes down too low, but it seems like it's not there, it's there. Uh, you know, you can leave that barrel and it looks like there's nothing going on, and all you have to do is kind of play around with it a little bit, and you realize, oh, there's some heat in there. There's some heat, there's some fire. And then all you do is, you know, again, fan the flame and it comes back up. Uh, we noticed uh, one of the other analogies that I had made was... Um, when the fire starts to go out. Remember this one, right? The fire starts to go out, and uh, all of a sudden all the smoke starts coming up from the fire, starts affecting everybody around us. We're all coughing and you know, we're trying to move away from the smoke because nobody wants to be caught up in a, a dying fire, you know, a fire that all the smoke and the smog is filling us. And I say that because now let's equate that to our spiritual lives. When your spiritual fire is going out, guess what happens? Smoke comes from it. And you know what it does? It envelops the people around you. They get affected by it. They're coughing, sneezing. Let me get away from this person because the smoke is now filling up and smog all around me. So as Christians, it's important for us to think about that. No one wants to be covered with the smog that comes from your lack of fanning your flame of your spiritual fervor. But that's what happens. That's the result of a spiritual fervor that wanes is unfortunately smog and smoke come out. So again, there's something for us to, you know, I don't want people to be covered by my smog and smoke. Uh, that I'm lacking to, to nurture the flame that the Lord has put within me. So I endeavor toward fanning that flame, and I hope you do as well. So God will fan that. He, he will give you that fire down in your soul. What did you do this week intentionally? Challenge yourself. You don't have to answer to me. Answer to you and God. What did you do this week, or what can you do this week to come? Intentionally to fan the flame of your faith and your spirituality. One of my season of fire disciplines that has been, uh, one of my season of fire disciplines has been to read through the Jewish Torah portions each week, along with some rabbinical commentary. What I'd like to do this morning is share some of my gleanings and personal insights from this week's Torah portion, namely because I believe it speaks to our current times. There really is so much going on in the world. It's hard not to get frustrated by what we see going on, either on TV, social media, or maybe in our, in our own relationships and circles. Maybe just the people we talk to, we can see there's a lot going on in this world. The world is going to hell in a handbasket is a fitting phrase for some. Look at the world and say, man, this world is just going to hell. Others frustrate themselves by asserting, remembering, Remember how things used to be? I have a lot of questions about that paradigm, but um, yeah, that, that's some are saying that. Man, I wish things were like they used to be. Political and social ideas and conversations are often so divisive that no one wants to entertain them. So now we can't even talk about the things that we think need to be fixed. The world's just become a frustrating place. Violence is in our streets. Violence is in our schools. Violence is in our churches. It's happening all across the United States. All across the world. Poor and needy seems to be adjectives that we can all relate to. I'm sure I know I'm not the only person that bought gas this week. Poor and needy, no doubt about it. <laughs> uh, and, and as we see and maybe feel financial burdens and chaos. It's in moments like this that we, the church, are called to examine ourselves and ask or and wonder and ponder, what should we be setting our eyes upon? What should we be setting, thinking about? What should we be spending our energy on? What conversations should we be having? What are our hearts set on? What are we sent to do? 
These are all things that we need to be asking ourselves. So I ask you, what are you setting your eyes upon? What do you see? Oftentimes what you see is a reflection of what you're setting your eyes upon. I know that's a message the world doesn't want to hear. I said that to quite a few people this week. I don't know, it sounds like you might be setting your eyes upon the wrong things if that's all you're seeing. Because I see God's uncommon solution. I see the world's problems. I see the common problems, no doubt about it. But I also see God's uncommon solution. Why? Because the Lord's my shepherd. Thank you, Lisa. The Lord's my shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what I see, because that's what I've set my eyes upon. So again, what are you setting your eyes upon? What do you see? What do you consider the church to be sent to do? Do you consider yourself a part of that being sent? Sent to do what? Is a big question, a good question that we need to be asking. The prophet Samuel said, Here I am, Lord, your servant is listening. Are you listening? Are we listening? The prophet Isaiah said, take that a bit step further, not only am I listening, but he said, Here I am, Lord, send me. So yeah, I'm listening. Hopefully you're listening as well. But I'm also saying, God, send me. And it wasn't exactly a popular thing. And it's usually not a popular thing to say, hey, Lord, send me. More often we see more of a Jonah situation than a send me situation. So are you listening to the Lord? Are you asking him to send you? Those two questions in your response might very well be contributions to the ills or the solutions that we see in the world. Yes, your participation. You might be magnifying the ills. That might be part of the frustrations that we all experience and feel. You might be part of the problem. Or you might be called to magnify the solution and be a part of the solution. And whether you're doing that and you're seeing that and producing that, that's God glorifying, amen. Or maybe you're, you're supposed to be doing something that you're not. And that might also be the reason why we see the things that we see. So again, I want to praise those of us that are doing the things we want to do, we are supposed to be doing, and we feel that and we nurture that. But I also want to compel us to examine ourselves in light of that as well. So this week, the Parshat was Parshat Shalah. And it comes from the word send. That's the, the, what that word actually means. Shalah means to send. And the readings were Numbers chapters 13 through 15, Joshua chapter 2, and Matthew chapter 10, if you're reading the Messianic, you know, accompaniment uh, to their readings. As I read through the Parshat this week, I thought of Israel's identity. The first part of it uh, that stood out to me was the spies. Uh, many of you, if you read Numbers chapters 13 through 15, uh, you're going to read about the story of the spies, right? We know that uh, before the Israelites enter into the land as they come out of Egypt, uh, they send spies ahead of them to go into the land. And we're going to read that text here in a moment. Um, but God sends them in. And what I find baffling, and I've been bringing this up in our circle for a while now, that God says to them, I've given you the land. I've given you the land. Go ahead. Send out some spies to the land that I've given you. The spies go, they come back and they say, there's no way we're going to get that land. Again, God said, I will give you the land. He didn't say you're going to have to fight for the land or it's going to be dependent upon how much strong you guys are, how many people you have, or what you feel like you look like in those people's eyes. I've given you the land. Go in there, check it out, come back, and get going. But instead, we know they come back, they start grumbling, they have a big mishap. They all start leaning on their own strength, their own faith, what they begin to see with their own eyes. You see what we're going to get at this morning. So I thought about the spies, and I said, that's Israel's story. Again and again, God tells them to do one thing, or this is the reality, and what do they do? They say, ah, we're going to define it on our own. We like it this way. You know, you said it's, it's plentiful and that it's going to be ours. We say it seems lacking and I don't think we're ever going to get it. That's their identity. That's the story through the whole Old Testament. These poor people lack and they, they don't see what God has put in front of them. And they don't believe God when he says he's going to give it to them. Again, the whole Old Covenant, again and again and again, that same story. Leaning on their own understanding, defining things their own way. Then the, 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 
uh, finality of the reading in Numbers actually brings you to talk about the tzitzit. That's the, uh, many of us know that's the uh, piece of string that would go down from the garment of the, uh, of the Jews. They would have this garment that would go down and it would, remind, it would have a blue little piece on it and it would remind them of sin. It was a reminder of sin. Look at this and remind yourselves of the commandments of the Lord and we know that the commandments of the Lord were to do what? Magnify sin. That's what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians. So the whole goal of that tassel, if you were to sum it all up, was to remind them of sin. You know, as we think about the laws of Moses, we realize we cannot do this by leaning on our own strength. We cannot do this. We're never going to fulfill these laws. What it should have caused them to do was not to become more religious, but to actually become more humble and repentant, leaning upon God, saying, man, we're never going to be able to fulfill these laws, but let's lean upon God's strength. And what's impossible with man will become possible with God. But unfortunately, that was not the story of Old Covenant in Israel. But that was, again, so I saw these two pictures here, the spies, the zitzit uh, that they were t told to have, and then also Joshua, this correlation now. Joshua says to them, God is with you. So Israel's Old Covenant story is that they're told God's with them. They're told to be mindful of the law. The law would magnify sin within them, would demonstrate the power of God in contrast to the lack of power that they had. But all of this was to actually paint a picture of God being with them. That if you recognize that you're weak, I'm strong, and you lean on me, you will be strong through me. That's what God wanted Old Covenant Israel to know. That, yeah, you're weak, that's fine. And that's why you have that zitzit hanging down, to remind you that you're weak. But if you lean in on me and you trust me and you take my word, it's not going to be your strength that's going to get you in the land. But if you lean on me... It will be my strength that will get you in the land, and then you'll be able to turn back and offer, as we know, a sacrifice of praise. That's not, unfortunately, we're going to read the text. That's not what happens. What's the opposite of a sacrifice of praise? Grumbling, murmuring, complaining. And that's what we see end up happening. That's Israel's old covenant identity. You lean on your own strength, you get murmuring, complaining. If you lean on the Lord's strength, it will ultimately lead you to a place of sacrifice of praise where you see his work in your life. So I went about finding some commentary on this text, and I found uh, Jonathan, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs taught on law and narrative, believing and seeing. Those of you that follow my teachings know when I read the word narrative somewhere, I'm buying that book, I'm reading that article, I'm, you know, that's how I am. I think narrative is beautiful. So I began to read in on this, uh, this commentary that Jonathan Sachs had to offer, and I had to bring it before all of you this morning. In talking about the spies, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs explains, The word used is latur, which means not to spy, but rather to see and explore. In the main narrative, the word latur is used seven times. A number significant, a uh, significant number often used to indicate a key word, seven. You see seven, gives you time. Let me see what's really going on. What is the complete picture the Lord is trying to paint in this text. When you see seven, or you see the number seven, or you see something mentioned seven times, God's trying to cause you to see a bigger picture of what's going on. So sure enough, this word for spy or see is used seven times in Numbers chapter 13 alone. It's precisely this verb that the Torah uses in the law of the tzitzit. So now notice this, the spies go in, latur. Right? You're going to go and you're going to spy out the land. The, the word used there is latur. Sure enough, when it comes to that tassel, the sitzit, the same word is used. In Numbers chapter 15, verse 39, it says, It shall be for you as a fringe, and you shall see it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and keep them, and not be led astray after your heart and eyes, which have led you to immorality. That's Numbers chapter 15, verse 39. Rabbi Sachs goes on to say, listen to the text. One cannot but hear the echo of the narrative. Again, he's highlighting that in the Hebrew, you really get to see the, the latur uh, is the word that's used for spy. Sure enough, in Numbers chapter 15, uh, talking about the zitzit, that, that string, it says, it uses the word velo tatura. Latura, velo latura. If you were listening to Hebrew being spoken, you would notice, that sounds like there's something going on with the story of the spies of the text and the sitsit that's hanging down. It's using the same Hebrew word. Latur velo tatura. 
Again, if you were listening in the Hebrew, it's much more pronounced. Matter of fact, Rabbi Sachs says, listen to the text. One cannot but hear the echo of the narrative of the spies in the law of the fringes. And this is not accidental, but essential. The law was designed precisely to avoid the error that occurred in the, state, in the case of the spies. I'm going to repeat that. The law was designed precisely to avoid the error that occurred in the case of the spies. The fringes on the corner of the garments are there so that in the future, people will not do what the spies did. So, of course, we need to ask ourselves a question. This is where you're going to open up your Bible this morning is, what did the spies do? Exactly, Edward. What did they do so we can learn something this morning? If you want to turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. Here in Numbers 13, I'm going to start, I'm going to read through this entire chapter. I'm going to read a little fast, just encourage you to follow along. And then I'm going to read some thoughts out of chapter 14. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out for yourself men that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, everyone a leader from among them. I'm not going to read through the names. Bounce with me over to verse 17. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up into the Negev, then go up into the hill country and see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. And how is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or are they fortifications? And how is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are, the trees in, are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went out and spied out the land, went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob at Lebo Hamath. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron where Ahaman, Shisha, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and from there, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. They carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the figs. That place was called the Valley of Eskol because the cluster from which the sons of Israel cut down from there. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and are large, and moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. By the way, reading that, as you're familiar with the biblical story, that's just, it's a nightmare in that land. They got the giant people. They got everybody that hates us. That's basically what they're saying as you read through that. It's just, it's horrible when we went up into that land. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we surely will overcome it. But then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land, though we have gone, the land through which we have gone in spying it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There are also the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Continuing. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. That's what a bad report does, by the way. You give bad news, it causes people to cry and get upset. Uh, and all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. A couple other verses I want to look at in this chapter, verse 6 through 10. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, 
a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. So you see, these are the men that believe in the Lord's promise, and the, uh, the rest of the congregation says, no, 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 we need to get these people out of here. We're going to stone them. They're, they're following what the Lord had said. A couple other verses I want us to take a look at here. Notice how this story ends. Jump with me to verse 39. And when Moses spoke all these ones to the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. This is what happens to a people that don't believe in the things of God, that begin to be frustrating themselves by what they're seeing with their eyes rather than listening to the things of God. People mourned greatly. In the morning, however, they rose up and went to the ridge of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We have indeed sinned, but we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. But Moses said, why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when it will not succeed? Do not go up, lest you be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be there in front of you, and you will fall by the sword, inasmuch as you have turned back from following the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. But they went up heedlessly to the ridge of the hill country, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and struck them and beat them down as far as Horma. I wrote in my notes, is this not the story of old covenant Israel? God tells you to do something, you don't do it. What you end up doing is you say, we're going to do it our way. That's the way that'll be victorious. And then they go about doing it. And I don't need to tell you the end of the story because you just read it. Things go from bad to worse because you're disobedient. You're not listening. The Lord told you initially what to do. He told you, I will give you this land. Go. Look at the land. See what it's like. Matter of fact, I noticed as I was reading even just now, I noticed the Lord told them to go into the land. He's going to give it to them. Moses told them, go in there and start to look around and see how strong the people are. God didn't care how strong the people were. I'm going to give you the land. Don't worry about what you see with your eyes. Don't worry about the things that might deceive you. So we see what the spies did. Came back, they doubted God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's what they did wrong. So the tzitzit that we're talking about there, if we're following Rabbi Sachs' wisdom there, he's saying the whole law is to magnify the problem that was of the spies. The spies came back and doubted God's word. The law was imposed to help people not, to help them see the error of doubting God's word. Notice the Israelites go by what they seem to see with their eyes rather than hearing the word of God. And I admonish us this morning, be careful that we're not a people that go by what we see with our eyes rather than what we hear by the word of God. Ancient Israel was a non-visual, even anti-visual culture. Jonathan Sachs goes on to explain, not completely to be sure, because we know they have pictures and pictorial things but far more than other ancient civilizations. This was because in Judaism, God cannot be seen. He's beyond the universe. He is not visible. Make a visual, visual representation of God, making a visual representation of God is the paradigm case of idolatry. We do not see God, we hear God. Knowing in Judaism is not modeled on the metaphor of sight, but rather of sound. The supreme act of faith is the Shema, meaning to listen, to hear. This is what the Torah wishes us to understand about the mission of the spies. It was fraught with danger because they made it about seeing. The Torah is consistently skeptical about knowledge based on seeing. So notice this. They could have either listened to what they heard or they could have listened to what they saw. What they heard was, I will give you the land. What they saw was, that's impossible. What they heard was, God is present with his people in this world. They is us. What they saw was a world fraught with violence and chaos. The question is, are we going to go by what we hear? Or are we going to go by what we see? Are we going to be captivated by what we hear? Or are we going to be captivated by what we see? One of those leads to a problem, the seeing. The hearing is what we need to be mindful of. I had written a couple years ago in a book, Wicked, many of you know of it, I said, it is not the happenings in the physical world 
that define reality, but rather how we conceptually understand what's happening and what the root of adversity and affliction truly is. In other words, it's not what we, it's not the physical happenings in this world, that's the reality. It's the conceptual reality we bring to the things of this world. So if we believe that the world's going to hell in a handbasket, there's no hope, then guess what our reality is? The world's going to hell in a handbasket and there's no hope. If we truly understand the things of God, if our conceptual reality is what God has provided, that his people will bring forth the healing of the nations, and we make that our obsession, our captivation, then that becomes our reality, that God's providing healing of the nations through us. And then, of course, what that encourages us to do is to try to find what the true source of affliction is. Is it the world? Is it politics? Is it, you know, the Christians? Is it, I mean, everybody's pointing their finger at something. What are you pointing your finger at as the source of affliction? Scripture points it at the carnal mind, which we all possess. If we think carnally, if we set our mind on carnal things, then we're going to reap and sow carnality in this world. But if we set our mind on spiritual things, we can reap and sow spiritual things into this world, things that lead to life and peace. We see the story with Adam and Eve. What do they do? God says, Eve sees. That's the story, right? God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve comes by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and says, she saw that the fruit looked good. She saw that it might make her wiser. Hear, see. Hearing is what we need to go by. Because hearing is the way that we know the truth of God. The spies, they're told, they hear, they go in the land, they see. They determine based on what they see, the situation, rather than what they heard. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 tells us about the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and interestingly enough, about the lust of the eyes. That's the problem. We define things based on our own reality. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 tells us that we do not walk by sight, but rather we walk by faith. I'm going to get to this here in a moment, but notice this. 2 Corinthians 5 says we do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. Romans chapter 10 says what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're seeing the theme? It's not about what we set our eyes on. Actually, it is about what we set our eyes on. But usually, unfortunately, and I'm going to get to this here in a moment, we define what we set our eyes on by what's going on in our heart and what we're listening to. We define what we see by what's going on in our heart and what we're listening to. That's the reality. Romans chapter 4 verse 17 talking about faith tells us that we are not to live in this world and define the world based on the things that we see, but rather, just as Abraham did, he called things that are not as though they are. That's what we're called to do in this world. Where things seem despairing, we're not supposed to be a people of despair. Where things seem fraught with frustration and violence and everything else, we are to be the opposite of those things in this world because we hear different, we see different, our hearts are different. Continuing with some thoughts from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. The assumption in all visual-based cultures is that sight is the most reliable form of knowledge. If you're in doubt about something, go and see. However, one of the achievements of social, social psychology has been to show that seeing is not a cognitively neutral activity. It is simply, it is not a simple matter of the impact, it is not a simple matter of the impact of sense impressions on the tabula rasa of the brain, part of your brain that I guess based on what you see, as if the mind were a camera. In other words, your brain is not a camera. It's not you see something and you take a picture of it and that's what it is. That's not reality. Instead, to the contrary, our impressions and perceptions are largely shaped by what we pay attention to and expect to see. Catch that. What you see is largely based on what you're paying attention to and what you expect to see. You ever hear those people that say, yeah, the world's getting to be a mess. We just said it. We all agreed. Why? Just keep setting our eyes on the world. Of course the world's a mess. Keep saying it. Keep doing it. Keep looking at it. 
There's a bunch of ways to say it, and I'm sure we each know one. However, I'm going to repeat what Elder Steve Hernandez said to me on a program more recently. The brain goes where the eyes look. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs goes on. Psychologists also speak of a phenomenon called the confirmation bias, which means we have a tendency to notice facts that confirm our pre-existing attitudes and disregard those that challenge or disconfirm them. And I know many of us have done this, where we've heard people say, the world's getting worse. You say, well, not necessarily. I mean, if you look back, the world was fairly bad back there. What do you mean the world's getting worse? When's the last time you saw somebody get beheaded, stoned to death, lit on fire? I haven't seen any of that, thanks be to God. So, yeah, when's the last time you saw that in your own locale? Again, you could go on YouTube. I know we're a globalized society, so now you can go on YouTube, you can watch anything you want. You, you want to set your eyes on damage and despair and everything else? You sure can. But again, most people, they're confirming their pre-existing thought by saying the world's getting worse is because they're just watching more and more bad stuff. When in reality, that's not the case. And now what if we created an ethic where we said, the world's getting better, day by day. We had visitors to church. We welcome new people into the body of Christ every day. Every day, every minute, every moment, there's new people coming to the knowledge of God. We all know I was a former gang member. I had no reason to be a part of the body of Christ, no desire. And yet God just reached in and grabbed me. God's doing that every day. He didn't stop. Every day, he's taking people that are prone to violence, frustration, and aggravation. I was one of those people. I was a contributor to the ills of this society, the things that we are lamenting, things I lament this day. I was a contributor to those things. But the Lord's reaching in. He's grabbing people and pulling them out according to his purposes. So what if I stopped saying the world's getting worse every day and I started saying, actually, the world's getting better every day because God's in it. God's here. God's with us. Optimists and pessimists, Rabbi Sachs goes on, Optimists and pessimists, radicals and reactionaries, religious believers and atheists tend to find what happens or what is discovered proves they were right all along. That's the way the mind works. Everybody thinks they're being proven right by what's going on. We select for attention the evidence that supports our prior convictions. We see what we expect to see. Going back to the story of the spies, another rabbi, Rabbi Menachem Mendel, pointed out that they're, uh, what the spies said in their statement. We were in our eyes like grasshoppers, notice what they said next, and so we were in their eyes. They were entitled to say the first half of the sentence. They probably really did appear as grasshoppers in their own sight compared to the descendants of Anak in the land. It accurately described how they felt but they were not entitled to say the second half. They had, not, they had no idea how they appeared in the eyes of the inhabitants of the land. That's a projection. That's what we call that, right? You're projecting. They merely inferred it and they were wrong. They assumed that others saw them as they saw themselves. They projected their sense of inadequacy onto the external world with the result that they misrepresented what they saw. Instead of ordinary people, they saw giants. Instead of towns, they saw impregnable fortresses. They were afraid. The confirmation bias meant they paid selective attention to the phenomena that gave them reason to be afraid. They paid special attention to the phenomena that gave them reason to be afraid. But their perception was not in the world, rather in their mind. They fostered that reality. As our brother Dr. Don K. Preston would say, catch the power of that. They manifested their own thoughts. They projected their own thoughts on the world that were not reality. They could defeat those people with God with them, but they felt, no, we can't. We must examine our minds, we must examine ourselves, renew our minds to be sure we are manifesting proper thoughts. Rabbi Sachs goes on, long before the birth of psychology, the Torah signaled that there's no such thing as the innocent eye. We do not simply see what is there. We select and interpret what is there. We notice some things, but not others. We make inferences based on prejudgments. But we, for the most part, are unaware of this. The result is that we believe what we see or what we think we see. In truth, however, 
We often see what we believe, that is, what we expect to see. The Torah conveys this with elegance and brevity by using one word, latur. That means both to see and to be led astray. Rabbi Sachs goes on to say the heart determines what the eyes see. The heart determines what the eyes see. So the brain goes, catch this, the brain goes where the eyes look, but the heart determines what the eyes see. Interesting. Therefore, perception is less about what is actually happening, less about what I might think I see, more about what is going on in the heart. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts would be opened. That's where we're supposed to see from, our hearts. I've labored in that text before, and I believe, again, if you read Ephesians chapter 1 and you read where he says, Read what the Apostle Paul wants, the eyes of your heart. When you feel you're looking at the world and you're despairing and you're like, Lord, shut my eyes. I might encourage you to listen, of course. But then another thing I might encourage you to do is go to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1 and ask him, Lord, open up the eyes of my heart. What should the eyes of my heart cause me to see rather than what the eyes, the lust of my eyes is causing me to see? Rabbi Sachs asserted, those with faint hearts see a world filled with danger. Those with strong hearts see a world that is great. No, just kidding. Uh, that's not the quote. Because if you see that, there's something possibly wrong. Uh, those with faint hearts see a world filled with danger. Those with strong hearts see the same world, but it's not filled with danger. It contains risk, but that does not make them dismayed. This is what Joshua and Caleb said. God is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. Our Lord told us, In the world you will have tribulation, but fear not, I have overcome the world. Furthermore, in John chapter 5, verse 24, I'm going to turn there so I don't paraphrase wrongly. Listen to the words of our Lord. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. We are a people that need to be hearing. Maybe we need to close our eyes a little bit and just listen to what the Lord has said and let that cause us to maybe change our, our seeing. Let's listen and then see. Kind of like what the spies were supposed to do. Listen to what God said and then go in the land and yeah, you're going to see the problems, but you're going to know God already said, I will give you the land. He didn't need them to go in there and give them their estimation of whether they thought it was possible or not. That wasn't the goal. So again, that's an admonishment for us too. As we see a world that looks like that land that the spies went into, let us not be afraid. Let us not despair. Let us not cause the people of God to continue complaining by bringing up reasons to despair. But rather, let's be a people that say... Let's go up and win. God is with us. We shouldn't be afraid. The spies were otherwise good people who failed to separate their perceptions from their fears. They carried with them their confirmation bias. They saw, but misinterpreted what they saw. That mistake cost an entire generation the chance to enter the promised land. Seeing is not always a form of knowing. Sometimes you have to listen not just look. And sometimes when looking, you need to remind yourself that you're not alone. You're not helpless. You're not friendless in the world. We have the church. Faith is not seeing the world as we would like it to be, nor is it a matter of blaming the world for not being as we would like it to be. Faith is the courage to see the world precisely as it is and refusing to be intimidated by it. We see in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So again, our challenge this week, we need faith. I think we all could say, Lord, increase our faith. Amen. Listen to the word of God. Hear the word of God. Read the word of God. If you don't like to read, listen. That's great. You can put it on audio app and just listen to it. Faith comes by knowing the word of God. What are you listening to? As I mentioned before, we walk by faith and not by sight. And of course this morning, 
we can acknowledge how deceitful sight can be. However, lest I be misunderstood as telling you to keep your eyes closed, no. However, know the lust of the eyes. Know that confirmation bias that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs told us about. And how they, how we, often see what we want to see. Let us make sure we're looking at the right things. Set your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, is what the book of Hebrews tells us. Set your mind upon things that are above, is what the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. And I'll conclude with this text, Philippians chapter 4. Verses 8 through 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence in anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things in the God of peace shall be with you. Thank you. And at this time, we will conclude our time together. I'll invite everybody to please stand, and we're going to ask the Lord to set a fire down in our soul. Amen. I'll encourage you to uh, pull out your lyrics, and we will sing Set a Fire. <laughs> 